Welcome everyone. My name is Diana Hoyt and I am the president of the Northern Arizona chapter of the Association of Fundraising Professionals. Now, I realize that some of you are listening to this live. We're glad to have you here. And some of you will be listening to this later. I want to tell you, you are in for a special treat. I personally am so looking forward to this. Um, I have known about Tom Ahern for pretty much most of my career as a fundraiser. And he is truly one of the esteemed members of our profession. So I'm gonna look forward to what Tom is going to have to say. I also wanna take a moment to simply say that all of us should be thinking about our colleagues, our nonprofit colleagues in California who are in danger of fires and the East folks in the Eastern and Southern states of the United States who, you know, it's enough to have a hurricane and then floods and now tornadoes in areas that never saw those things on a regular basis. So it's kind of scary and actually it's very scary. So I hope everybody's thinking about them and sending them good wishes. I'm gonna turn this over to Jim and he's gonna introduce Tom. Hi, I'm Jim Anderson, um, partner in Goldbusters Consulting, and I am also the education chair for AFP Northern Arizona, the small but mighty chapter. Um, we have fewer than 50 members in our chapter, but it's going to be amazing because based on the feedback to the event today, we're going to have four times as many members as we have actually viewing this today. So on that scale of good things, bad things about the pandemic, well, being able to provide great educational content to people regardless of where uh, they are physically located is, is one of those pluses. So I'm, I'm glad that we're able to bring um, a, a legendary donor communications writer to you today, um, a person I count as a good friend, Tom Ahern is joining us. And uh, I'm gonna switch back over to gallery view to make it a little easier for you to see, see Tom and I as well. See, because Tom, Tom and I, we go back a long way. In fact, I think the last time I saw you in person, Tom, we were at a speaker's dinner in Toronto and, um, and we, we had fun with the table by lying that we shared a birthday together. <laughs> a, a day a day that will live in infamy because well you know it was an innocent lie but we just wanted to sit together and talk and they were organizing us by birthday so hey, it, it worked out for us well tom i don't want to take up too much of your time today thank you so much for donating your time to afp northern arizona i know that um, you know that we are a small chapter, you, you know that um, the ability for us to provide these educational um, opportunities is greatly dependent upon the generosity of speakers like yourself. So, so Tom, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and um, hand this over to you, let you share your screen and, um, okay. and take it away. All right, Jim, here we go. I'm going to share my screen. I will double down on what Diana said. I, I made the mistake of looking at the news just before I came online, and I am praying for people in Louisiana and above and California and all the other people that are suffering. We are fighting for everything on this planet right now. And in a way, that's that's the what fundraisers do or what their missions do. And that makes it a very important job. Okay. So what we're looking at today is kind of an overview that is has evolved for me since uh, the pandemic started. And I update this all the time, um, pretty much every week, actually, as new things come in. And um, I wanted to share this with you today. So it's called Nothing's Changed, Everything's Different, which pretty much covers the waterfront. Some of the things we're going to talk about are very um, eh, kind of the basics. And other things are kind of the new stuff, you know, the not the shiny new stuff, but the well researched new stuff. And um, here, for instance, is a slide from uh, Alan Clayton, who's from the UK and his team. And um, as you can see, I circled in red, the most difficult donation is the first one. And once you have that first one, then the other things can happen, monthly giving, legacy, and so forth. But um, 
you need to get that first one in the door and it is really, really tough. So let's look at how Wikipedia talks about this and Wikipedia has gotten uh, quite a bit of criticism for making um, statements like this, but I happen to know the, the um, people behind the scenes and they're actually raising as much money as they, ever, as they can with statements like this. And you can say, I put it in red, 98% of our readers don't give, they simply look the other way. Now, that is the reality of fundraising for pretty much every cause I've ever encountered. You have a small core of, um, I don't know, I call them truest of true believers, uh, dedicated, willing to step up. Um, even if you make mistakes, they're willing because they love the mission. They want the mission to happen. And um, but Wikipedia, you know, this is an enormously uh, successful operation. I give to it uh, as a monthly donor because I use it almost every day. And it's, it, you know, it just felt right to do that. But most people don't. Ninety eight percent do not. All right. And that's just problem number one. Problem number two, <laughs> that's getting that first donation to come in. Problem number two is retaining that first uh, time donor. And as you can see from Blackboard's 2020 giving report, um, it's about seven out of 10 first time donors do not make a second gift. And uh, what that brings us back to is kind of the subject of today's talk, which is, are you speaking in ways that encourage or are you speaking in ways that discourage further donations? Because, well, um, in my experience, looking at thousands and thousands of pieces of donor communications over the decades and continuing to this morning, um, because I'm always looking at stuff, uh, we still have serious problems in the nonprofit sector in terms of how we speak to our donors. Now, the, the more common way, um, certainly not for people that are like Diana or like uh, the clients for Jim and Alice, but the more common way as a default for people that are not well-trained is we talk about how good the the charity is, the programs. We did this, we did that, we were amazing. Oh, and if you happen to have sent in a gift, um, thank you, we'll put your name on a list. And uh, sometimes to make it extra special, we'll put a name, your name on a list and then break it down by who the cheapskates are and who the people are that actually gave a lot of money. Um, and, you know, that, that those kind of uh, conventions in the fundraising world, um, they're unchallenged, but they need to be challenged because um, there's another way of talking. And the other way of talking is what's called donor centric. Now, donor centricity is a merely a term borrowed from marketing, and it, it, it sort of rose up in marketing um, back in the 1950s and then became uh, much more common in things like the Harvard Business Review in the 1980s, 1990s. And it got adopted into the nonprofit sector by um, Penelope Burke, for instance. And she just took what was called customer centricity and revamped it as donor centricity. And, and what that means is simply that as a communication strategy, you uh, put the donor first and there's uh, good psychological reasons for doing that. So you took the you take the very same statement you just saw, you know, we did this, we did that, and you kind of flip it on its head and you start with with your help, all these amazing things happen. And part two, just as important, without your help, they won't. So you're you're actually creating um, what the uh, better fundraising company calls a hole that only the donor can fill. And when you do this, as it says at the bottom of the slide, you will raise more money, you will raise more money faster, okay? Let's look at a um, uh, kind of the prime example of this that I encountered in my own career. And um, 
It came from a children's hospital called Gillette, which is based in the Twin Cities in um, Minnesota. And what you're seeing on the screen at the top is the headline from the earlier uh, do so-called donor newsletter. It was sent to donors. And, um, and then the new headline at the bottom, Zawadi says thank you, which is what they switched to. So in the earlier iteration, the what I would call an organizational proud newsletter at Gillette, we, we're doing, you know, we're setting the span, standards for spine care. So we're doing great medicine here. Yes, you are. And um, so forth. But, they, you know, the truth is people assume you're doing great stuff. Uh, when Zawadi comes in, that's a patient who is uh, actually she was born with her feet pointed backwards and through an excruciating um, uh, kind of surgery that takes months, they turned her feet around, right? So it was um, uh, it was a, um, a, a, a these are two subsequent issues. So there was that issue at Gillette and then there was Zawadi was the next issue. And uh, here's the thing, the, um, the old way of doing it, well, the doctors love that, you know, and, and actually what happened was the fundraising uh, development department would get requests from the parents of the doctors saying, can you send us, uh, you know, a dozen extra copies so we can pass them around, around the neighborhood and show what our, you know, our wonderful child is doing as a doctor. And, um, and that's fine, that's fine. But in the fundraising context, um, what the donors liked was Wadi saying, thank you. You helped a Tanzanian girl stand tall on her own two feet. And here is the financial results. And this is why it matters. We have, we not, this, this happened, as you can see in the lower right, it, this happened in 2007. It was at that point, a wild ass you know, uh, trial that pretty much nobody in that I was aware of, and certainly no hospitals, institutions are very slow to change uh, their behaviors, um, had ever tried. And yet this, this particular development department had taken one workshop, similar to what you're listening to right now, and decided, well, let's see what happens. And what happened was that they, between one issue and the next, from instead of talking about how great the organization was, they started talking about how great the donor is, they got a thousand percent increase in giving. And that was mind-blowing. I'll, I'll take you back to the 1960s and 70s. It was people going, oh my Lord, look at, look at what can happen. And so other people started jumping in and, and adopting the donor centricity as, as a uh, communications uh, strategy tactic, whatever you want to call it. And for instance, his heart of the mission. Heart of the mission is uh, Nashville rescue mission. They deal with um, the population which is homeless and of course since the pandemic uh, that population has exploded and um, but back in 2017 you can see they they had adopted this um, had, it's kind of their their standard approach what you're looking at is a cover from their print newsletter and they would mail this out uh, every month and uh, they would uh, harvest from that monthly print newsletter uh, two million dollars extra, not not in a you know not buried inside the rest of the fundraising. Two million dollars extra coming in from their print newsletter alone, and every you know every every uh, front page was kind of the same format. You'd have a beautifully shot photo of somebody who had been homeless and now certainly does not look like he's homeless. And in fact, he's on a long road home because of you. And that's the important language here. Because of you, Paul found a safe place to stay. And every cover has some version of the words because of you. In fact, it's actually an acronym in the uh, fundraising um, uh, lingo, B-O-Y, boy, because of you, right? That was 2017. Here's something from 2021. This was um, 
written and uh, for Animals Asia. And Animals Asia rescues uh, what are called moon bears. And uh, those poor bears, they are um, captured in the wild and put into tiny cages. And then they are milked for their bile, which is used in uh, some form of, you know, um, uh, native medicine. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible existence. And, um, but you can see, yours is a love that shines so bright for the animals. It finds bears hidden in the darkest corners of this world, and on and on and on. Look at how, what it says under Anne Marie. If your love hadn't found Anne Marie that day, she might not have made it out and uh, snow was lost in the shadows until your love found him. Now, can you write this way? Yes, you can. <clears throat> I can. You can too. And uh, all it takes is for you to be kind of um, get over the fact that you're an institution and that you want to, you know, sound institutional and proper and unemotional and scientific and data driven and all those other things that absolutely do not matter all that much to your average donor. You're, you're always shooting for my heart. You're not shooting for my head, uh, that is the rational part of my brain, because the heart writes much bigger checks, okay? So um, let's continue if I can get it to go forward. Um, <clears throat> What we discovered with this, because you just saw, you know, it went from uh, 2007 Gillette and then, you know, Nashville Rescue started bringing in big bucks with their newsletter. And then you saw Animals Asia. And that's how all of their stuff, you know, what, no matter what it is, email, print, whatever, appeals, newsletters, thank yous. It's all like that. It all has that same tone. And what it was is charity started to realize that if they treated people not as wallets and not as purses, that if they treated them as people with feelings, they'd start to raise a ton more money, right? So, um, <clears throat> yes, I'm, I'm definitely trying to advance this. I don't know why it isn't. All right, so here's a nothing's changed one. This is... Um, looking at uh, what has always been there, whether you're doing it or not, okay? And um, what has always been there is that your thank yous and your newsletters, uh, and now because of social media, your posts that go out to the people that are part of your uh, supporter family, whether they've actually gone the extra step and made a gift yet doesn't actually matter. We're just trying to get as many people on our list as possible. Um, but these things that we are sending to them, what they are, I think, is how an organization reaches out and hugs the people in its base, right? And um, now why do we want to hug them? Well, let's look at this statement from Tom Belford. Kiss eight out of 10 goodbye. All this is is a confirmation of data you just saw before from 2020 from Blackbaud showing that um, seven, eight out of 10 first time donors do not make a second gift. So we got to do something about that. That is a communications issue. And what we found, what the industry has found, and through the Institute for Sustainable Philanthropy, among other people, um, that in this, the Institute, by the way, is, is based over in the UK. It's the uh, brainchild of uh, a psychologist, Dr. Jen Chang, and a market researcher, Dr. Adrian Sargent. And they put together the Institute, and they you know, have all these doctoral students running around doing you know, special research and all sorts of stuff. But what they found was that that, you know, here I've boiled it down into very simple language. Uh, when you like your donors, you know, you hug them, you say nice things to them, they'll like you back. <laughs> 
And they express that liking you back uh, by giving you more money and staying with you longer, which increases what's called their lifetime value. And, you know, in the testing that was done by the Institute, doubling of donations was quite a common uh, achievement. So here's something. This is this came to me uh, 2020. You can see it's from Julie Capaldi at a United Way down in Pickens County, South Carolina. And um, this is what a donor uh, sent to her. Julie, she's the ED there. Julie, you know, you do write the best thank you notes of just about any charitable organization in which I've been involved. Wonderful stuff. And what was stuffed into this with, with this note was a $100,000 gift, a check for $100,000 because she writes the best thank you notes, right? So cool, Julie had a girl. Um, now let's go backwards a little bit into, you know, what's, what's going on. It, fundraising is pretty simple in a one, at one level, which is it, it's, you know, just two brains in the room, my brain, your brain, the writer's brain, the, receive, the recipient's brain. And, um, one of the things we all heard growing up and uh, have probably, you know, internalized uh, was that uh, uh, flattery will get you nowhere. You know, your mother would tell you that, you know, mom, you're the best mom in the world. Can I have another scoop of ice cream? And she'd say no, because flattery gets you nowhere. Well, she was wrong as um, uh, Roger Dooley points out here in this book, Brain Fluence. By the way, when you see the little guy in the lab coat, that means we're talking data and science. Uh, mom was wrong. Research shows that actually the human brain did not evolve to discern between false and true flattery, that all flattery, uh, even when we dismiss it, uh, has a, a positive effect on people. And so you need to take that to heart. Now, here's an example from a charity I've sponsored um, uh, kids at for a bunch of years because it's such a wonderful charity. It's a um, it's an orphanage in Tijuana, which is one of the murder murder capitals of the world. It's an orphanage. These are kids abandoned on the streets, and um, and they the orphanage takes them in. And what what we know now because the orphanage has been around since the 1980s is that eventually about 100% of these kids go on to college. So they not only were rescued from the streets, they go on to higher ed, which is a pretty amazing before and after story. And this is a very typical example of their kind of communications to donors like me. And uh, it happened to be just an email and it was letting me know that there was this video. And in this video, I could look at Carla and Diana um, and they were going to show me how to make an apple banana oatmeal smoothie. So what are some of the, the messages here? Before, cruelly abandoned by their parents. Now, Carla and Diana have you and your apple absolutely the love these girls need. You were born to be kind and you are Vita Hoven. And Carla and Diana are so excited to show off their English skills for you. Enjoy the video. Of course, you, you know, the, the, the involvement rate jumps with this kind of um, material because it's fun. Put the fun back in fundraising. See what happens. Okay. Mm, everything different? Well, yeah, not necessarily. Um, here's something that is uh, promoted by the Institute for Sustainable Philanthropy, but many other people, because they've observed that it works. And that is, don't thank me for my gift. Thank me for who I am. Thank me for my identity, my self-identity, the thing, me on my best day. And uh Here's Jen Shang, the psychologist, and she, you know, stuff I've learned from Great Brits, because that's where she lives now. She's actually born in China, educated in the U.S., married uh, Adrian Sargent. Uh, he's a Brit. And then they moved back, had a couple of kids, and they live in Plymouth, England. And um, 
one, one of the things she has uh, harps on, I got to tell you, she does harp. For the donor, your thank you is the most important communication. Now, if you're thinking, well, yeah, I hate those thank yous. They're such a pain in the neck. I wish we didn't have to do them. You know, and your thank you starts out with on behalf of the board of directors, blah, 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 you know, and uh, here's your receipt. Um, then you're, you're, you've got a lot of good room to grow here. In the emotion on the emotional side um it shouldn't you know it, it needs to be emotional and so here's the basic difference when you say your donation counts you're speaking to my wallet when you say you count you're speaking to my sense of self the things that make up that identity that i rely on so heavily to kind of define myself, to define myself and define my behavior. And, um, you know, what am I going to do? Now, here's an example. This is another charity that I give to and give to for many years because I know their work and they do good work and it's tough work. You know, they're dealing with um, youth, really, uh, who have often dropped out of school. Uh, maybe living in a car, living in the woods, living in a tent, uh, don't have any future uh, very apparent in front of them and are going down, you know, the drain. And they, res they rescue these kids. They have great um, programs there and the programs are wonderful. But here's, you know, this is their, their thank you. This is just a thank you. You understand they're not asking me for money. They're thanking me. And um, I circled a couple of things, you know, first of all, they personalized it. Hi, Tom, who believed in you when you were a teenager? And see how fast that takes me back to my personal life, my values, how my values were formed. And, and I'm thinking, well, you know what, I, I went to a wonderful Ivy League school, because one of my high school teachers made it possible for me to do that. He, 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 you know, kind of cleared the road for me and got me into that school. And it has benefited me a lot. And so I had people who believed in me, even when I was having a tough time, and I was not, you know, a perfect child at, at any, <laughs> I tried to drop out of school, that was an interesting moment. Um, but, you know, somebody believed in me. And so they connected with me, they connected with me. Here's another great Brit, that's Richard Radcliffe. He's also known as Dr. Death, because he specializes in legacy giving. And um, Richard, uh, said this to me one night we were in Amsterdam and you know doing what you do in Amsterdam and um, I happened because I'm a writer I always have a, note, a little notepad with me and a pen and he was talking about he, he had interviewed over 25,000 donors uh, in focus groups about why they gave to their you know quote unquote favorite charities and he said you know after all of that i gotta tell you and then i started writing donors are staggeringly ignorant of the causes they support but he did not mean that's a bad thing he meant lucky us they um they don't need to know how our wonderful bizarre programs work they they have their own reasons for giving whatever is already packed into their head they may be ignorant of you know the insider stuff but that doesn't matter what they already have in their head in abundance is personal values they have their own personal experiences good and bad they have the way they were brought up they may have you know faith-based beliefs they have secrets they have passions they have regrets and angers and hopes and also because they're human they have built-in empathy which is not common in biology empathy is is a fairly uncommon thing in biology humans have it all right, let's look at nothing's changed. And I'm going to give you a couple of simple tests. And these simple tests, um, doesn't matter whether you're doing digital or print, um, that's important to know because they'll, the, they're they always going to be useful to you. All right. Now, the first test is the U test. And if you've followed any of my 
uh, writings or my newsletter or blah, 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 whatever, um, you know that I harp on this. And the reason I harp on it is because I didn't come in to fundraising from the nonprofit world. I came into fundraising from the commercial world. And in the commercial world, this is something you are taught on day one, that the word you is one of what, what are called power words. Uh, new is another one. Free is another one. And uh, these words have carry much more weight than other words. And it's not just a pronoun. It is a word that has an emotional connotation for uh and, and it connects with me as soon as you use the word you it's about me right and it's about myself that in identity we were talking about and it gets people reading and it keeps them reading that's very important keep them reading um you can call it whatever you want to call it i call it well, vitamin y and one of the little guidelines is that your reader's eye should never be more than an inch away from the next word you and you know it's a guideline it's not a rule because i'm going to show you an example and yes there are a couple of spots here where your eye is more than an inch away maybe from the word you but i circled each instance of the word you and we study success in these workshops these webinars and the um the reason we're looking at this particular two page appeal letter is it is an acquisition letter, which is very uh, difficult to make go into the black. Um, but it was sent to people who were new patients at um, the sharp uh, healthcare system in San Diego, and it would be sent to them maybe four to six weeks after they had been discharged so that, you know, the people had started to heal and so forth. And, um, and we're just talking to them and saying, you know, you, you got what you needed. Can we um, ask you to please consider uh, making a gift to Sharp because it is a nonprofit community hospital and it depends heavily on philanthropy in order to be as good as it is. And uh, again, if you look at the measles here, you look at all those red circles, you're going to be seeing over and over and over the, how the word you is always uh, is omnipresent, right? Um, here's another one. The easy test. Now, this is this. I call this one a little bit different because the easy test uh, became far more important around 2007, and uh, before then, around the year 2000, uh, scientists measured the attention span of the goldfish versus the average adult human, and uh, the average adult human had a longer attention span than the average goldfish. Oh, good. We beat the goldfish. Uh, then 2007, two things happened. Uh, social media through Facebook started to become a true worldwide phenomenon that just took over. And the other thing that happened was the iPhone was introduced by Apple in 2007. And by the next time, which is 2013, that they measured the, uh, the attention span of the goldfish versus the average adult human, um, the human law. And now the goldfish is number one. And by the way, that book by Ben Parr that you see on screen, that's uh, if you're looking for a good book that'll give you a ton of ways to capture people's attention. Uh, they're all there in that book, right? So it's, it's a helpful book. And in fact, any book you see here, I'm recommending because uh, it might get you somewhere, somewhere being in fundraising more money. This piece was created by Toronto's Agents of Good. That would be John Lepp and Jen Love are the principals there. And uh, it was done for a hospital. And the hospital, they were basically tearing down the old hospital, which had been, you know, in the neighborhood. Everybody's kids were born there, blah, blah, blah. And um, they were going to build a brand new hospital that was what they were they, you know the insiders were very proud of because they were calling it the first all digital hospital in uh, Canada and whoopee you know again the insiders and the outsiders have very different points of view and uh, when they started talking about this well yeah okay that's good I guess um, 
and but no money was coming in so they started to uh they they went to agents of good and they said give us a different approach and so agents of good came up with that goofy looking character you see there with the hard hat so that means construction and put eyes on a heart and uh you know, the H is for the um, Humber River Hospital, which is what it was called. And this is the outside envelope of an appeal. And you give us lots of heart. Follow me and I'll show you how. And when you rip it open, this Humbert, that's what they call this little character, um, would take you through, lead you by the hand through this new all digital hospital and explain why, you know, they needed money for this and why they needed money for that and blah, blah, blah. And they started to make serious money. Now, what was the, um, <laughs> you know, what's the secret sauce here? Uh, the secret sauce, let's go back, see, goofy guy, anthropomorphism, uh, putting, basically putting eyes and a smile um, on something that, you know, didn't necessarily have eyes and a smile. We, we as humans, like eyes and a smile. And here's a test uh, Kevin Schulman was talking about in Donor Voice, um, where they tested, you have the control, which is on the right, the, the blue, and then the, the test, which is got the green. And all the, the only thing that was different between the control and the test is instead of having the currency um, symbol, I think this is Chinese, I, I, I don't know. Um, it's some kind of currency. Um, but when they put eyes and you know muscles and a smile and eyebrows and a, and made it put a face on it essentially um the uh, the number the amount of average gift uh kind of doubled right so yeah cheesy you betcha and um goofy absolutely and should you do it you bet you should um because people will like it and this is not about you being pleased it's about them being pleased right so here's another thing that hasn't changed and this is my favorite guru in the face of the earth seth godin and he once said our target markets are often, quote unquote, lazy people in a hurry. Now, just like Richard Radcliffe said, um, donors are staggeringly ignorant of the causes they support. And that was a good thing because they were supporting them for their own reasons. Um, lazy people in a hurry is what you have to deal with. This is the reality of the, you know, trying to speak to a target market. And um, so how do you do that? Well, here's another test for you, Good. The, the faster test. And um, here's one of the things you, you wanna be aware of when you're writing stuff. And uh, this came out of Dr. Adrian Sargent's mouth. This was um, at a, we were doing a master class at a retreat up on Loch Ness, that's Scotland you're looking at there. And that is Loch Ness in the distance. And that's the little boutique hotel we were doing the master class in called the Inch. And, uh, and I'm taking copious notes. I was one of the presenters, but I was not the prime presenter. I was listening to Adrian talk. And he said this, you know, gotcha, made you feel something. And that's what you're trying to do all the time with donor communications is make the reader feel something, right? Um, now, cross that with this insight from Dan Hill, who's a psychologist and wrote a book called Emotionomics, and uh, in which he points out that humans have gut reactions very, very quickly. Uh, gut reaction being I'm leaning towards you or I'm leaning away from you. And how fast does this happen? Three seconds or less. Whoa. So let's look at two letters, two appeals, one built to succeed and one built to fail. Now, this is the built to succeed version. They're basically the same letter. And you don't actually have to read this letter. What you have to note is the reading ease. You can see it up in the upper right in red. Reading ease, uh, this is scored in Microsoft Word, was 96 out of 100, which is very, 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 very good. It means I can zip through it. Uh, 55 is kind of your minimum. The grade level is grade level two. That doesn't mean you're raising money from second graders. It means that any average person can consume this, can consume your prose uh, very rapidly. And here's what it was built out of. 
here's the one that was built to fail. This was the original. And uh, the reading ease in this case scored in Microsoft Word 45 out of 100. So it's below the minimum of 55. And the grade level was 11, which um, is very high and unacceptable. And basically, this was for college. Uh, basically, if it is, if you're prose scores at grade level 11, it's an automatic rewrite until you get it down to at least grade level eight. And, um, you know, if you try to explain this to a boss who doesn't know what about the background for this, they're going to fight you all the way. But um, it's it's it has to do with speed the lower the grade level the faster i can consume your prose and if you give me um work to do mental labor i'm going to quit and that isn't how you're going to get me to act you're just going to be driving me off uh, there's another quick test, the me, not me test. And I got this from Jen Chang. And she said, again, we're back at the inch on Loch Ness. And uh, by the time you get to three not me's, you've lost their heart and therefore their money. So let me show you. Um, well, here's, here's an example of what is me. Anything that has to do with my own backyard is a me. That's an automatic me. So the thing local here, and this is from the True Sense Fundraising Field Guide, which I think you can still get free online. Um, people like to give to their own backyard. We all want to live in the best place on earth, but the, even you know the best place on earth has problems. So we want to be helpful to our neighbors and our own communities. So that's a me. That local is a me. Now, here's an example. This is back. Um, this actually goes back to that appeal I just showed you that was built to fail versus built to succeed. And um, I label the things that are me and I label the things that are not me. And I may and also I highlighted the word you. You can see that with yellow and you can see, well, you know, it's, yeah, dear Tom. So that, yeah, that's me. But then the first paragraph is not about me. And the second paragraph is not about me. And the third paragraph is not about me. And then finally, the word you comes wandering in the door goes well, am i in the right room etc cetera, etc cetera. so this again is built to fail this would be automatically rewritten by a trained copywriter now on the other hand you have this from Mor morningside ministries down in san antonio and um, this was sent out during the pandemic for a, an emergency appeal they're trying to raise very quickly money so that they can improve um, online access uh, particularly for uh, what is called telemedicine uh, for their, these senior living communities. They needed about, uh, well, it says here, they needed $22,000. They raised that $22,000 in about 48 hours with email alone and um, using a, um, a formula that was devised by the Better Fundraising Company. And it's, a, you know, you can see it's an eight point appeal for e, e appeal formula, which you can find online, by the way. And if you want to borrow it, um, they were the Better Fundraising Company, Jim and, and uh, Stephen were just given it away and and they you know it was a wonderful thing for them to do it raised millions and millions of dollars across the country for all sorts of charities including morningside ministry but i label you know each instance where it is talking about me you know right there i don't normally send you emails like this okay that's me, about me will you please make an urgent gift to keep seniors connected man yeah. That's we need your help. That's about me, but you can help her, me, your gift, me. So, you know, it's it's the letter, you know, one of the dark, <laughs> less than dark, one of the light, bright secrets of appeals is that they're not about the organization. They're about the person reading them. And uh, and so let's let's internalize that. Yeah. Now let's look at some stats. So where are we? Are, you know, has has online giving has digital finally taken over fundraising? And the answer is not even close. 
Um, here is Black Baud 2020. And finally, and it was driven in large part by the pandemic, finally, um, in this 2020 giving report, you can see that the overall, that's the one, the, uh, the chart, the, you know, the diagram on the far right is up to 13%. That's 13%, which means that 87% of the money was not given online. <laughs> so get this get this straight. This is not like, hey, online, you're winning. No, it's um, online will win ultimately, eventually, somewhere down the road, but it is not right now. Now, if you're a small organization, go to the left, well, uh, that is small being in their definition, less than a million dollars annually in revenue, um, then yeah, you're, you're more likely to be making um, a heavier percentage of your fundraising uh, through online means. But what that probably means is that you don't have a very sophisticated program and you're doing what you can do, but it isn't, um, you know, it isn't producing that much revenue. Now, another thing to be aware of is uh, the average age of the U.S. donor. You often, so often hear, and, you know, board members are not trying to be um, um, difficult. They're trying to be helpful, but they're, they'll say things like, oh, we need younger donors, on the, I guess, on the theory that if you get them, you get people to donate when they're in their 20s, they're going to continue with you for the rest of their lives. That's not actually how it all works. And the average age of the US donor right now is 64. And that actually is, is on the low side because normally it would be 64 and above. People age into their prime giving years when they have enough surplus income that they can give to charity. And that happens around age 55. How much uh, are they gonna give you? Well, it's gonna be a small amount if it's under $1,000. The average is 20 bucks and so forth and so on. Now, it, where can you get all this data in one place? Well, I'm gonna pitch my own book here because I spent a year researching this and talking to experts around the world. And it's in this book, if only you'd known. And it's, it's what it is, is, is get rid of your presumptions because often we're chasing these, these these myths, these, these ideas that have no basis in fact. Uh, for instance, you know, like get a younger donor, they'll stick around forever. Well, how long does the average donor stick around? <clears throat> Not as long as you would hope. Um, there are two answers here four to six years, that's assuming they make that second gift, which is why monthly giving is so important. But um, if they are monthly, they may stick around seven to 10 years just through inertia working on your side. Now, do you want to bring in a lot of these $20 gifts, these $25 gifts? Well, yeah, you do. Because here's different research. This is from the Veritas group. And the Veritas group uh, specializes in major giving. And uh, they they, you know, they're very scientific, very data driven. And as you can see, I've made it red so you can spot it. The majority of major donors um, came in through a direct response mail appeal where they gave a gift of 25 bucks, right? That's the reality of fundraising as you're building your base. Um, now, here's something you all need to be comfortable with, and that is the concept of offers. Uh, putting the right offer in front of the right person at the right time is the secret to a sale, right? So you just got an MBA, um, but, you know, congratulations. And so what does an offer look like? Well, um, an offer is anything I can respond to. So, I mean, it, it doesn't have to even be a financial um, an appeal. It can be, would you sign our petition? Would you consider attending our event? Would you sign up for our e-newsletter? Our e Those are all offers. But I wanted to show you a, a one, a, again, we, we study success. So anything you're seeing here is stuff that I know actually how it did. And um, what you're looking at here is a very nice piece put together by Jeff Brooks, who's a great copywriter, Andrea Hopkins, one of my favorite designers. But it's not for a big group. It's for the Connecticut Forest and Park Association. They've been around, well, since the late 1800s. Um, they basically right now uh, tend 
um, hundreds of miles of hiking trails in the state of Connecticut. And um, this was one of their appeals. And you can see, uh, I've labeled it, that they, this is a matching gift offer. So if you give me, if you give uh, CFPA one buck, it becomes two bucks. And then you have these little footprints, you know, and we'll find out, oh, let's see, you know, again, anthropomorphization, uh, isn't this fun? And we open it up and uh, what's inside? Well, there are a couple of things, uh, three things actually inside. There's a four page letter and um, don't ask because it, <laughs> yes, a four page letter written by somebody who knows what they're doing will always out pull a shorter letter. Uh, however, if you're not, well trained than a than a two page letter is fine a one page letter is not fine um and but look at you know you see the words stay focused look at how frequently they go back to the offer there's the um, what's called the johnson box which is the headline above the salutation matching funds double your impact and there's the the key word you and so that's one version of the offer and then you go down and then the first bold face statement you hold twice as much power in your hands right now to save our forests or again your gift will double there's the offer again and uh, next in a highlighted every dollar you give now will become two dollars for our you know so again a double 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 last sentence so when you give the power of your donation will double and, um, and then you turn it over there are three more pages doing the same thing there's also what's called a um uh, uh, uh something or other i got uh, what did I call it? Oh, it's a lift note. And um, the lift note is the thing that falls in your lap. And it is, we're back to anthropomorphism again, where because the lift note is apparently read it, written by a blue spotted salamander esquire. So he, uh, that salamander has a law degree and he, he's writing to the, uh, the, the, the tribe, the family, the uh, the you know the base, the nature lovers that make up the Forest and Park Association, and he's saying, "Dear neighbor, we haven't met. I'm pretty good at hiding, but I've seen you, uh, and I feel a little sorry for you because you don't have blue spots, but you look okay anyway." And so, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we have finally the reply device, which is based. In, in marketing, this would be called the point of sale. <laughs> and the point of sale is where I find, you know, a lot of times a, good, a uh, trained writer uh, for appeals will write the point of the um, reply device first, and then everything is built backwards from there, because this is your destination. This is where people who are going to say yes to you, this is where they're going to go. And again, we see the, the beautiful, not the average, the beautiful blue spotted salamander is an indicator species for the health of our forest. So that's good. We, need, we now know why this salamander is so important. If the salamander is doing well, so are the forests. And yet it is endangered in Connecticut. Save the salamander, you save our forests. And a big, you know, splash with a burst, matching funds, your $1 equals $2 for the forest. So, you know, it, it, it's consistent it, um, throughout the, the pack, which is what you call everything, you know, envelope, letter, uh, lift note, reply device, that's a, called a pack. And um, it's consistent, it's clear, it's obvious. If I'm reading it at 100 miles an hour, I still get it. And um, you know, yeah, I mean, look at that. If you're reading it 100 miles an hour, you see the big yellow splash and you go matching funds, your $1 equals $2 for the forest. Okay, I get it. Uh, all right, I'm gonna give you, this is getting towards the end. This is the um, Donor Communications 101. What is the real purpose of donor communications? You know, your boss might say, well, it's to make money. Why should we send this stuff out if it doesn't make money? And that's, you know, that's a byproduct. It's for sure. And you're hoping it'll do that. And if you follow the rules you've been learning today, uh, maybe it will. Um, but here's the real purpose of donor communications. And that is in the black to make your donor feel good. That's all. 
That's why you're doing this. Because if you make me feel good, I will like that and I will respond in kind. And my way of responding in kind is to like you back. Remember that? If you like me, I'll like you back. And so how are the ways you can make me feel good? Well, there are so, there are so many. I mean, this, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Just, you know, tell me how deeply appreciated I am. Take me on a journey. Uh, tell me I should be proud of what I did. Um, tell me how needed I am and, and give me purpose in life. Tell me you really, 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 really need me. Give me some, some light entertainment value. I'm not talking about you know a, a, a stand-up comedy but you know show me stuff i haven't seen before instead of stuff i've seen a million times and hug the heck out of me here we are again with vita hoven the uh orphanage in tijuana and uh this was just one you know they send something every month and because i'm a monthly donor there and this one happened to be around uh valentine's day and it says meow and forever we love you, Tom. And everything about it, dear Tom, today and every day, you really are everything that's right about this world. You show up, you recycle whenever possible, you smile at strangers, you vote even when it doesn't seem to matter, but you don't stop there. You jump into action for a friend in need, you share your food with the hungry, you feel outrage in the face of cruelty, you just can't contain your goodness and love, Tom. Nicely done. And uh, so you've got three things going on here in donor communications. You're asking for my help, then you're thanking me for that help, and they're reporting back to me what you did with my help. This is, again, the Better Fundraising Company. You should get to know them. They, they have a lot of good stuff. They have a, a weekly, uh, every Friday, uh, graphic that they send out for free. What I want to point out with that, you know, that little cycle there, ask, thank, report, is that... Uh, don't you know charities get hung up on asking because they want the money yeah give me the money and, um, but that's only one part of three uh, asking is part of an entire system and the real treasure as Julie Capaldi found when she opened the envelope and found a hundred thousand dollar check for United Way in there is the real treasure hides inside your thanks and your reporting um one last thing from the Institute for Sustainable Philanthropy, people give for their own reasons. Each donor is on a personal journey. Now, you can take advantage of that if you survey your donors. And if you don't survey your donors, you're going to have to guess, and that's not as good. Um, now, here's something that the um, people at the Institute came up with, and it's, they're called booster statements. And it's a new thing. It's used with... Um, at the point of sale again so this would be a reply device again animals asia and um, and these you know these booster statements it's not just the affirmation statement the yes statement the booster statement is uh, where you can express yourself so this is a way actually of surveying your donors um you know, I'll check it. Yes, being a defender and protector of abused animals, even one suffering out of sight, half of the world away, is an important part of who I am as a person. That's what a booster statement is. And if you want to learn how to write such things, then you can take a certificate course from the Institute for Sustainable Philanthropy. They're all done online. And uh, also, if you want to learn more about this stuff, you can subscribe to my free how to e newsletter at that URL, www.ahern.com.com. Also, there residing right now is a PDF on the homepage above the fold, uh, which is of this entire show, which you just saw. So that's it for today. And thank you for being with me. I'm going to stop sharing now so I can get, get some other people back with us. Hey, Jim. I said, hey, that, that was fun. Okay. I had, to, I had to have it on mute because I was typing so fast, clicking away with all the questions and feedback on the Facebook live stream. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> what did people want to know? Oh, I, I've got, I, I'd have a couple of questions for you, but um, I, I guess one of them that, that was um, 
mentioned a few times was whether or not this presentation will be available after this live stream ends and it will we're we're yep. recording it and it is um it'll stay on the um on the afp northern arizona chapters facebook page in the videos so you can check it out at any time if you joined us late or if you ended up having to leave early so that's available um we did have people that were watching I, we had fabio from italy had, had made comments and thanked us for the presentation Sharon from Australia, um, a number of our friends up in, in Canada and Vancouver and other areas. Hey, Beth Ann, how you doing? Um, and, and lots and lots of folks from all around the country. So let me go back here and start with Amy. So Amy is from New York City, and mm -hmm. she asks, why is a four page letter considered the best? Why isn't it thought of as a drag to read? <laughs> Amy, that is the, the most often asked questions. And the answer is that this is going to, it's going to be a two part answer. Answer number one is that a four page letter written by a well trained professional copywriter will almost always out pull a shorter letter. Now, that's direct mail 101. So many things in direct mail are, well, why, why is it that way? And the, the answer is because we tested it and that worked better. And so, you know, it's not really an answer. It's not like, oh, now I get it. Um, the, the, um, some of the prov provisions for that is once you have acquired a donor, usually four page letters are used with acquisition rather than renewal. And once you've acquired a donor, let's say they've made two or three gifts, and so they've shown that they really care about the mission, then you can go to a shorter letter. Um, what you would find in a four page letter written again by a professional is that it is extremely entertaining and it's full of, you know, delightful um, insights. It's full of flattery. It's uh, very quick to read. I mean, it's four pages in one way because uh, it could have been two pages, but they spread it out over four pages so that you could skim it more easily. So there are a lot of one line, two line paragraphs. There are bullet lists. There are, you know, the line length is pretty narrow so that you can uh, just kind of cruise through it. And um, the, the thing to realize is that it isn't the page count that matters. It's the entertainment um, values of the letter that matter. And so if the entertainment values are good, the offer is clear, I feel like you're giving me an important job to do, then uh, I'm not paying attention to the fact that it's four pages long. So the, the conclusion, what was the second part of Amy's comment? Not was, a drag to read? Why, yeah, why isn't it thought of as a drag <laughs> to read if it's that long? It's not a drag to read because it's not a drag to read. It's fun to read. And, and people, you know, they, this isn't a novel. When people read direct mail, they don't start on page one and go all the way to the exciting conclusion. They, they're, they jump around. And um, a good, a well-written direct mail letter is taking advantage of that behavior. Uh, there's a lot of eye motion studies that are behind how direct mail is written. And they go back to the 1980s. And, it, you know, the fact that we are now in a much faster uh, world, as you know, learned from the goldfish, um, doesn't, hasn't really changed that. All right. Uh, we've got a, we've got a, a handful of uh, additional questions here. I'm going to go with one from Chase. I, I didn't see where Chase is, is uh, um, watching from today, but he asks, uh, where or how do you include all of the legal disclosures that are required by states? Is it small print on the back of a reply device or <laughs> is there a better way? Not a lawyer, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to be uh, dismissive of that. I just don't know, honestly. Yeah. Well, if somebody has to do that and, and with the goals that you pointed Usually out. Usually so it's far, in tiny type on the back of the yeah. reply device. There you go. Yeah, so yeah. Um, so I guess I guess your first instinct there was was a good one, Chase. Okay, how about <laughs> from from Barbara Clark? Who um, Barbara? I hope you're you're doing well and you're safe there in Baton Rouge and oh, the area. 
Um, yep. Barbara asks, what thoughts you have on appeal copy for a news organization following a natural disaster? Did you say news or new? She says news. Okay, N-E-W-S. Yes. Well, um, a natural disaster is, uh, I need mean, to be crude about it, is a, is a great opportunity to raise money, assuming anybody still has a mailbox. I mean, right now, what I saw in the news before we got on to this program was that hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people still don't even have electricity and may not for a month in Louisiana. So, um, you know, if you're trying to appeal to somebody, let's say through email, and they don't have any service, well, that's just not going to work. But um, I think, you know, what you could do with that, uh, is it going to be an emergency in a month? Yeah, not, not at the same level. But in a month, you go back and say, you know what, the news mattered more during this emergency than it had in, in, in so many months before then. And, you know, it was, it was difficult, but thank goodness we had our supporters who made it possible for us to, to do whatever it was they did, you know, get in a boat and go find the real story and, uh, you know, whatever it is they're doing. I mean, if they're doing something worthwhile and people want that, that thing they're doing, and I think that, you know, the, one of the things we've seen over the last couple of decades as newspapers have declined in their print um, you know, reality and, and moved into a digital reality is that the ones that are doing the kind of news we really crave are finding their way to a financial model that's stable. Tom, let me, let me jump in and qualify because um, she, did, she did share a bit more detail and it's oh. actually a public radio station or um, well, it's public media. That, Perfect. Um, that she's specifically talking about. Okay. So, well, cool. Um, um, <laughs> again, you know, it, what one of the um, one of the things that is just a technicality is they must have a way to give. So if you know people can hear them, and in fact uh, act on it, they might um, they might you know, be very uh, eager to contribute because I don't know how it is in Louisiana. I know how it is in my own neck of the woods and NPR and uh, public radio and public television, but mostly public radio for me um, is probably my primary source of good information. There, there are a few more questions and I know you were gracious enough to stick around and answer all the questions. I, however, have to be on another Zoom call shortly. <laughs> okay, Jim. So, Understood. So I know we've got a couple. I know we've got a couple of other things that we want to talk um, or talk about, but I do specifically have to share a message from a friend of all of ours, and that's uh, Jan Brazel. Uh, Jan, oh, says, Jan. Thank, thank you to Tom, and and she says, "Diana Hoyt!" Exclamation point. Nice to see your face. <laughs> <laughs> Say hi to Jan for me. She's been a real trooper. I, I think you just did. And um, I would like to thank, I believe it's pronounced Catriona, uh, who is um, watching today in Montreal. She had shared the link to the, the PDF and to Tom's uh, website as well. It's in the chat. If you just look over there, you'll see that too. So um, Tom, anything else you'd like to share before we hand this back? No, over thank to you. No, thank you all very much for coming. It's been a pleasure. Well, Tom, I, I truly appreciate you taking my call when I when I reached out and said, <laughs> hey, 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 Tom, what do you think about just doing something for free? You know, we simply <laughs> share a birthday and everything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I think there was liquor involved. <laughs> there, there was, that, that is not uncommon when the two of us are across the table from each other. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, thanks again, Tom. We really appreciate this. Uh, we had more than 200 uh, viewers today and, and, um, and so many people that were engaged. We really appreciate each of you taking some time out to watch the presentation today. And of course, it will be time. Remain it will remain available. So you can um, watch this or return to it or share it with others whenever you like, just by visiting the Facebook page for Northern Arizona, um, AFP, Northern Arizona chapter. Uh, and, and with that, 
Diana, I, I, I want to hand it back to you and, and ask you to, to help us wrap up and tell us what's coming up in October. This was wonderful, Tom. It was, um, uh, I am so excited about what you shared with us. And I know that it was a, a marvelous, marvelous learning experience. Diana, you, thank you, you. You actually met all my expectations. That was pretty cool. <laughs> um, anyway, um, to uh, the Northern Arizona chapter members, um, we're looking forward to having you uh, join us. Um, we haven't scheduled something for September yet, but we will be on top of that soon and get back to you and um, have scheduled our October uh, session on uh, Halloween horror stories. Um, from my point of view, I hope some of you will come with some Halloween fun stories, kind of those uh, <laughs> treats um, that we all enjoy. So looking forward to that as well. Jim, thank you for putting together a very wonderful program for today. And thanks to you for your leadership of our chapter. It's, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, and um, we will continue to have our monthly programs at this point. Our, our online presentations, such as this one, uh, we expect will remain free. Um, obviously, anything can happen. But right now, if you wanted to make sure that you don't miss any of our upcoming sessions, you can simply like the chapters page and you'll get notifications. Um, Tom, Diana, can you stick around for just a minute? But um, let's uh, say goodbye to everybody else and, um, and wrap this up. See you.